Now, last session, we took a detour and we looked at the actual case for where Mount Sinai is today, whether it's in Egypt, the traditional location, or whether it's the Arabian location in modern Saudi Arabia. So take a look at that video if you missed it. And while it has some apologetic value, it doesn't really affect anything that we're going to talk about in this video. And that is the concept of a portable mountain of God. So before we jump in, as always, if you haven't subscribed yet, really appreciate it if you would. Click the little notification icon. That will let you know when a new video in this series comes out. We've been putting these out pretty regularly, so the best way to not miss them, because social media and YouTube posts don't always come through in everyone's feed, just click notifications. And then that way, every time we post a video, YouTube lets you know. And as always, we have Disciple Dojo gifts and designs available in our online store. So take a look over there, see if there's something you like, or maybe you want to get for your favorite Bible nerd in your life. Those are just a couple of ways that you can help support this growing ministry. Very much appreciated. Okay, enough of that. Let's get into Mount Sinai, the portable mountain of God. So we're jumping back to Exodus 19. This is after Israel has come out of Egypt. They've gone through the waters of Yam Suf. They've arrived at Horeb or the mountain of God. Again, see the last video in this series for which mountain that is. And we read in chapter 19 of Exodus, in the third month after the Israelites went out from the land of Egypt, on this day they came to the Sinai desert. They set out from Rephidim and they came to the desert of Sinai and they camped in the desert and Israel camped there in front of the mountain. So Israel has arrived at Mount Sinai. Again, this is the Arabian location, which I think makes more sense of the text, but you could apply any of this to the Sinai location as well. Regardless, and Moses went up to God and Yahweh called to him from the mountain saying, thus you will say to the house of Jacob and you will tell the Israelites, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I bore you on eagles' wings and I brought you to me. Now, if you will carefully listen to my voice and keep my covenant, you will be a treasured possession for me out of all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, but you, you will belong to me as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So then there's more exchange between Moses and Yahweh and then Moses and the people. And then down in verse 20, it says, And Yahweh went down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So you have Yahweh coming down onto the mountain because he dwells in the heavens. And Moses going up to meet Yahweh. Yahweh coming down, Moses going up, they meet on Mount Sinai. This is an important concept visually and symbolically to have rooted in your mind. Verse 21, And Yahweh said to Moses, Go down, warn the people, lest they break through to Yahweh to see, and many from them fall. And even the priests who come near Yahweh must consecrate themselves, lest Yahweh break out against them. And Moses said to Yahweh, the people are not able to go up to Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. This is what God had told Moses to do earlier in the chapter. And Yahweh said to him, go down and come up, you and Aaron with you and the priests. But the people must not break through to go up to Yahweh, lest he break out against them. So then in chapter 20, we have the famous Ten Commandments. Yahweh himself there's thunder and cloud and lightning and storm. It is a storm theophany at the top of this mountain. The whole mountain's covered in smoke and fire and, and just terrifying. And God speaks, audibly speaks, the ten words, as they're called in Hebrew. And then at the end of that chapter, chapter 20, the people are terrified. And they say, we, we can't stand this. Moses, you go talk to God. This is overwhelming. This is too much for us. The people remained at a distance, and Moses himself went up to the cloud. Then there's a couple of chapters where God gives the laws, the, the basis of what's going to be the rest of the laws of Torah. He expands on the Ten Commandments. And so then we come to Exodus 24, where the covenant is confirmed. There's a covenant ratification ceremony entering into this relationship between God and his covenant people, Israel, between the great king, Yahweh, the suzerain, and his vassal, Israel, who he has rescued. And look how it's enacted. And to Moses, he said, go up to Yahweh, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, those are Aaron's sons, and 70 from the elders of Israel, and you will worship at a distance. And Moses alone will come near to Yahweh, and they will not come near me, and the people will not go up with him. And Moses came, and he told the people all the words of Yahweh and all the regulations. And all the people answered with one voice, and they said, all the words that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of Yahweh, 
And he rose early in the morning and he built an altar, keep this in mind, at the base of the mountain and set up 12 memorial stones for the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men from the Israelites and they offered burnt offerings, because that's what you offer on an altar, and they sacrificed sacrifices as fellowship offerings to Yahweh using bulls. And Moses took half of the blood and he put it in bowls, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. So this is the ceremony. This is the actual covenant ceremony taking place. And he took the scroll of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, again, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do and we will listen or we will obey. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. And he said, look, the blood of the covenant that Yahweh has made with you in accordance with all these words. The people literally take the blood on them through this symbolic act. Verse 9, And Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 from the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel, and what was under his feet was like sapphire tile work, and like the very heavens for clearness. And toward the leaders of the Israelites, he did not stretch out his hand. And they beheld God, and they ate, and they drank. And Yahweh said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you the tablets of stone and the law and the commandments that I have written to instruct them. So this covenant meal that's been celebrated between the heads of the tribes of Israel, Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's sons. Then after that, Yahweh says, now, Moses, come up to me, and I'm going to give you the actual written tablets that I have written with this law on them. So verse 13, Moses got up, and Joshua, his assistant, And Moses went up to the mountain of God. And to the elders he said, Wait for us until we return to you. Look, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute will bring it to you. And Moses went up the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of Yahweh settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And he called to Moses on the seventh day from the midst of the cloud. And the appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain to the eyes of the Israelites. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and he went up the mountain and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So here is what we have in this scene, Exodus 19 through 24. You've got the people at the bottom of the mountain, at the base, and the people are told to consecrate themselves and offer sacrifices. So there's an altar built, there's blood sacrifices given, the people have to wash themselves. So you have a ceremony involving water, washing yourself, purifying yourself, and then you have a ceremony involving blood, where the lifeblood of the animal is literally sprinkled on both the people and on the altar where they're worshiping. Then, further up the mountain, so the Israelites aren't allowed to go up on the mountain, Aaron, his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, the elders, they go up the mountain further, And this is just to give you an idea. It's not like this is the exact spot on the mountain, but just so you understand, they go up and they share a communal meal. So there's this this closer drawing to God and they get close enough where they can see God in some way. It's, It's couched in approximate language. You know, what was under his feet was like sapphire tile and like the very heavens in terms of clearness. Even though they're seeing the God of Israel, like overall, that's God. That's the God that's on top of this mountain and we are entering his abode and this is terrifying. They're still not getting a full unimpeded view of him. You just get this approximate language. It's very similar in later visions of God. When people behold him, it's almost like language is not enough to put into words what they're actually seeing, but they are in his presence to some degree and they are sharing a covenant meal with him. And then after the covenant meal, Moses and his successor, Joshua, they are brought up into the very presence of God, who has descended on Mount Sinai in fire and thick smoke and cloud. And this is a storm theophany. So that's just what's going on setting-wise. Now, what's the big deal? What does it matter? What can we learn from this? Well, one of the things worth noting is For the next six chapters in Exodus, God is going to reveal to Moses architectural plans. He is going to give Moses the directions for how to build what we call the tabernacle. The text tells us he sees or God shows him the pattern of his tabernacle on the mountain. And this is basically what he's told to build, this big square courtyard area. These are curtains with posts 
that hold up the curtains because all this is going to be portable. And then inside this whole big area, you have the altar. And then next to that, you have the bronze basin. Later in Solomon's temple, this will be referred to as the sea. And it's this giant bowl for purification, for washing. Then you have a structure within this massive courtyard. You have this tent structure and it's divided into two rooms. And the first room, there's a table here and there are loaves of bread to be put on the table, 12 loaves, one for each tribe of Israel. And then on the other side of the room, there's a lampstand, a menorah, and it's built to be shaped like a tree and it's to give off light. So you've got this tree giving off light and this table with bread on it. And then beside there, you have the altar of incense. And this is where incense is burned to create and fill this whole area with aromatic incense. Then there's a curtain. And on the curtain are woven images in gold of cherubim, angelic beings. We'll look at those in more detail in a future video in this series. But then on the other side of the cherubim, past the cherubim, through the curtain, you come to this cube dimensioned room entirely covered in gold all over. And in the middle of it is this chest. And this chest is the box that the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod and some of the manna are to be placed in. But on the top of it, you have these two creatures with wings facing each other. And just think of what you saw in Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's a pretty good approximation of what it was. I don't know about all the face melting stuff. And that is said to be Yahweh's throne. He is said to dwell above the cherubim, over the Ark of the Covenant, within the Holy of Holies, which is connected to the holy place, which is all within the tabernacle courtyard on this side of the altar and the washing basin or the sea. And the entrance is here on the east. Now, this is the part of Exodus that people just glaze over when they're reading. Most of the time, people, oh, I'm going to read the Bible in a year. They get to these chapters of Exodus and they're just like, all right, I don't even know what I'm reading anymore. It's just chapter after chapter of directions on how the tent is supposed to be made and how the lamp stands and the pedestals for the bases and the curtains and how these are all to fit together. And it just becomes, imagine if somebody wrote out Ikea directions in longhand and you didn't get any pictures. That's similar to how most people feel when they start reading these chapters of Exodus. But if you take the time to really look at what's being built, the pattern, the materials, the way it's being constructed, the directions, which way it's supposed to face, the dimensional proportions, all of these things, you start to notice some pretty interesting details. Now in this video, we aren't gonna have time to go through all of the fixtures and all of the materials and all of the symbolism and everything, it's just too much. But the thing that I wanna key in on this video and highlight is who is allowed where. Because what you notice when you see the tabernacle plans laid out and you start to look at the directions that God gives, inside, is where the worshipers can come. The Israelites can enter the tabernacle and they can present their sacrifices. To do so, they have to be consecrated. They have to wash and the sacrifices have to be clean. And the priests who perform the ritual, they have to be washed. And then they take the animal and they sacrifice. Rituals are performed with the blood and the animal sacrifice is eaten, depending on what type of sacrifice it is. And there's a celebration. So this is the area that all Israel can participate in. In, so long as they have met the Levitical purity requirements, they can enter into the tabernacle and participate in this ritual meal presided over by the Levitical priests. But then as you go further into the tabernacle, you come to the holy place. And unlike the courtyard where all the Levites work and operate and camp outside of, in the holy place, only the Aaronic priesthood, only the priests in the line of Aaron can enter this. And that's where you find this meal. You find the bread symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel, and you find the light, the tree that gives light, God's presence shining over his people. And then only one time a year, Yom Kippur, only one person, the high priest, can enter into the presence of God himself mediated through the Ark of the Covenant. 
And that's where the rite of purging the sin from the people once a year is done. The, the tabernacle, the whole tabernacle itself, theologically, symbolically speaking, the image is it absorbs the sinfulness of Israel for the year. But at some point, it becomes saturated with sin and needs to be cleansed. It needs to be purged and the sin needs to be removed. And so there's an entire sacrifice where the sin of the people is put onto this entity called the scapegoat. And then the goat is led out into the wilderness and the sins of the people are carried away. And that in and of itself could be a whole video. If you are interested in knowing more about that, check out the video series here that we taught a few years ago, Leviticus, the book Christians usually skip. And we go through chapter by chapter, all of the sacrifices in Leviticus, all of the imagery, all of this stuff. But just note the pattern that you see here, because it's basically the same pattern as the mountain. You have these levels, you have this gradation of holiness or access to God's presence. So just as only Moses and Joshua, his successor, could meet with God only when God called him that one time during those 40 days. Then a little bit down the mountain, though, the priests and the leaders of the people, they had their communal meal with God. Then down at the base of the mountain, you had the Israelites who had to be consecrated and they participated in their sacrifices. But there was a distance between the people and God to some degree. So the tabernacle, when you think of it, you know, these overhead type diagrams, they just kind of give you a, where you're looking down at it. But think about Mount Sinai being compressed down. And that's what the tabernacle is intended to be. Or conversely, when you think of the tabernacle, imagine pulling it up section by section to recreate Mount Sinai. And that's what the tabernacle is. The tabernacle is symbolically a portable Mount Sinai. And the layers within the tabernacle are meant to be like the sections of the mountain. Now you can't carry a mountain around in the desert. That's why it's a series of tents and poles and implements. It's mobile. But what it symbolizes is Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is the mountain of God. This is important to understand because in the ancient Near East, the gods were believed to dwell on some faraway mountain. And the very image of a mountain was symbolic of the distance between humanity and the gods, the remoteness, the arduousness. So if you wanted to have communion with the gods, you had to go up the mountain. This sheds light on the Tower of Babel story. The people in the Babel story were trying to invade the realm of the gods, so to speak. They were trying to make themselves great by ascending into the divine through this architectural building project. Well, the tabernacle is kind of like God's answer to Babel. It's God coming down to dwell with his people. God takes the concept, which is known everywhere in the ancient Near East, of the mountain of God. And he says, okay, I'm going to show you what my mountain's like. So he brings them out to him, Mount Sinai. So far, so good. Everybody in the ancient Near East would be like, yeah, okay, well, Baal lives on Mount Zaphon. Maybe some of the other gods live on Mount Hermon. Uh, so this Yahweh character, I guess he lives on Mount Sinai, Horeb. But after bringing Israel to himself, Israel's not the one who found Mount Sinai. God brought them through Moses and through the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, brought them to himself at Sinai. So there's no humans achieving the divine in the Old Testament worldview. It's always an act of grace. Salvation is always an act of grace and mercy, never personal merit or individual effort. After bringing Israel to his holy mountain, they spend like a year there at the base of the mountain, camped out learning just what type of God this Yahweh is and how he is different from the gods of the surrounding nations and how they as a people are to be different from the peoples in those surrounding nations. And so God gives them the tabernacle before sending them out, before they leave Mount Sinai to go enter the promised land. He gives them the tabernacle as his presence in their midst, saying, you can take Sinai with you. I'm not going to stay here in the desert. I'm going to dwell in your midst. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And they set up the tabernacle and it is mobile. And then eventually the temple itself gets built by Solomon. And that becomes the focal point in the land. And this new mountain of God becomes Mount Zion. So the tabernacle was representative of Mount Sinai. 
And then when the temple is built, that becomes the focus of all of Israel. That becomes Mount Zion. That's the new mountain of God. If you go to Israel, Zion is not really a mountain. It's barely a hill. There's no mountain called Zion at Mount Zion. What makes it a mountain is that's where the temple was, the Temple Mount. So unlike all of the other gods that have these huge, lofty, impressive mountains in the ancient Near East or throughout the Greco-Roman world, whether it's Mount Zaphon, whether it's Mount Hermon, whether it's Mount Olympus, unlike all of those, Yahweh's mountain is in the center of his people. And he has come down to dwell among his covenant people while still being the unapproachable, transcendent king of kings, creator of the universe, the one who's above all. His transcendence and his eminence, they're both embodied in this portable Mount Sinai called the tabernacle that eventually gets planted on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. As we've seen so often in this series, God takes known cultural concepts with religious significance or political significance or a mixture of both because the two weren't separate in the ancient world and uses those concepts to communicate something to his people and to the nations around them, but with a profound twist on those concepts. We've seen it with the image in the garden. We've seen it with the chaos serpent dragon imagery. We've seen it with the rainbow. We've seen it with the building of a temple after a victory. He's doing it once again with Mount Sinai itself. Because throughout the ancient world, people associated mountains with the gods. In the Yale Anchor Bible Dictionary, the entry on Mount Hermon, it says more than 20 temples have been surveyed on Mount Hermon and its environs. This is an unprecedented number in comparison with other regions of the Phoenician coast. They appear to be the ancient cult sites of the Mount Hermon population and represent the Canaanite Phoenician concept of open air cult centers dedicated evidently to the celestial gods. And the article on mountains in the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology talks about how Mount Zion, where the temple ultimately was built, is called Har Beit Yahweh, the mountain of the house of Yahweh in Micah, Isaiah, and Second Chronicles, or Har Habet, the mountain of the house in Micah and Jeremiah. And that's a term that would have resounding echoes throughout the ancient world, the mountain of God's house. It would bring to mind things like the Canaanite high god El, who lived in a tent on a mountain, or Anath, who lived on a mountain, or Baal, whose temple was built, as we saw in the last video, on Mount Zaphon. And so they go on to note, the concept of a cosmic mountain is well known from Mesopotamia, Syria, and other parts of the region. R.J. Clifford, his book, The Cosmic Mountain, examines the relationship between Old Testament and Canaanite ideas about the cosmic mountain. While this concept is somewhat fluid, it denotes a place where the gods are to be encountered in a special way. And even in Psalm 48, there's a reference to Mount Zion as being in the far north. Now, that doesn't make much sense because Zion's not really in the far north. I mean, Zion's like right in the middle of Israel. But the far north, literally in Hebrew, is remote Zaphon. And Zaphon is a mountain in Syria where the Canaanite god Baal had his temple. So Psalm 48, 1 through 3 is probably best understood as a deliberate polemic against such claims for Zaphon, asserting rather that Zion is the dwelling place of the only God who is worthy of consideration in human affairs. And so the tabernacle is God's way of giving Israel a portable Mount Sinai. It's his way of telling the Israelites, I'm not going to dwell in some remote, far-off place. I've brought you to myself to enter into relationship with you. This is how Moses puts it in his last speech before he dies. As they're standing on the precipice of the promised land, looking across the Jordan into the land that they're going to dwell, Moses speaks to Israel. He gives them his final series of sermons, and then he dies. And that's known as the book of Deuteronomy. Listen to what Moses reminds this new generation of Israelites whose parents were brought out of Egypt at the Exodus. 40 years prior. He's telling them about the covenant and reminding them of their covenant obligations that their parents made at Mount Sinai. And he says, for this commandment that I'm commanding you today, and, and he's talking about the Torah, the law, all of it. 
is not too wonderful for you, and it's not too far from you. It's not in the heavens so that you might say, who will go up for us to the heavens and get it for us and cause us to hear it so that we may do it? And it's not beyond the sea so that you might say, who will cross for us to the other side of the sea and take it for us and cause us to hear it so that we may do it? Moses is telling the people, no, the Torah, the law, This covenant is not like that. That's how the other gods do things. That's how the other peoples and their ancient heroes did things. Gilgamesh went on his journeys. The heroes in various ancient cultures had their journeys that they had to go to, up to the heavens, to the underworld, whether it's Gilgamesh, whether it's some of the Egyptian heroes. But Moses is telling Israel, but that's not Yahweh. He says, but the word is very near you, even in your mouth and in your heart, so that you may do it. See, I'm setting before you today life and prosperity and death and disaster. What I'm commanding you today is to love Yahweh your God by going in his ways and keeping his commandments and his statutes and his regulations. And then you will live and you will become numerous and Yahweh your God will bless you in the land where you are going. So the tabernacle is God's presence among his people while they're in the wilderness. And it's intended to be his presence among his people when they get into the land. The Dictionary of Biblical Imagery puts it this way, The sacred mountain achieves its clearest expression in the Old Testament motif of the mountain of God, or the holy mountain. Two separate mountains are part of the image. First, Mount Sinai, or Horeb, and later, Mount Zion, on which the temple stood in Jerusalem. The mountain of God possesses all the other mountain attributes and adds some special nuances. God's mountain is a holy place on which God dwells and reigns. It's a particularly threatening place that becomes a welcoming place for the righteous. God speaks of planting his people on his holy mountain. Originally, the mountain of God was Sinai, but through time and the movement of Israel into the promised land, Zion displaces Sinai as God's dwelling place on earth. And then as you move throughout the Old Testament, you come to the prophets and you come to psalmists who look forward to a day when all the nations stream to Zion, when Zion is lifted up it's, it's nothing right now. I mean, it's barely a hill, but it's lifted up and becomes the highest of mountains. Well, that's not necessarily speaking about geography. It's talking about theology and the nation streaming to Zion and God's people dwelling in safety on Mount Zion. The image that the prophets give us, no longer barren, no longer uninhabited, no longer somber. Zion is the first of many mountains to be transformed. Unimpressive in appearance and virtually indistinguishable from the hills and ridges all around it, Zion will become the chief of mountains. And so one example of this comes from the well-known passage in Isaiah chapter 2. It says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of Yahweh shall be established as the summit of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow to it. Many peoples shall walk and say, Come, let us ascend the mountain of Yahweh to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so that's the long-term goal of what the mountain of God is going to become. And and we're going to go more into the imagery and specifically the Eden imagery in a future video. And we're also going to look more in the next video in this series on the concept of holiness that this portable Mount Sinai is intending to instill to Israel every time they interact in any way with the Levitical sacrificial system. But when we go all the way back here to Exodus, the very beginning, when God gives his plans for the tabernacle and commands Israel how they are to live in his presence in the midst of the nations around them, and even how they're to set up their camp while they're living in the wilderness before entering the land, the imagery is so powerful. If you look at the way the camp is laid out, what you see is among the Gentile nations in the world, you have this people known as Israel. And the camps, while they're in the wilderness, are set up three tribes on each side, north, south, east, west. And then further in towards the center of the camp, you have the Levites and the four families within the Levites, the Merites on the north, the Gershonites on the west, the Kohathites on the south, and Moses and Aaron's family on the east, right at the entrance to, in the very center, the tabernacle, God's mountain tent. And in the center of that tabernacle, you have the concentric layers leading into or rather 
up to, symbolically at least, the very presence of Yahweh himself. So Yahweh is dwelling in the midst of his people who are in the midst of the nations. And his goal, as we've seen here in our video on the Old Testament in under an hour, is that by remaining in covenant with him, Israel will be the means by which the nations are drawn back into relationship with the God who created everything. So in order to fulfill this destiny, Israel has to understand who they are and who God is. And they have to basically be taught about holiness. And that's what the tabernacle is. It's an object lesson in holiness. And the concept of holiness itself is fascinating and has so much to teach us. And that's what we're going to look at in the next video in this series because... We're out of time in this video. So there's a lot of cool stuff that we could take from this. And you could spend years exploring all of the significance of this concept of God's portable Mount Sinai. I just want you, in this video at least, to have it on your radar as you're reading the Old Testament and as you're reading the New Testament. Let your ears perk up whenever you come across the word mountain or mount or temple or sanctuary because there's a whole sea of imagery swirling around in the background. And the more familiar we are with it, the more things we notice in scripture that we may have missed before. So that's all for now. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo.